I would like to call upon our moderator now. Um, it is going to be Dr. Sabrina Akhtar. She is the assistant professor at the American University in the Emirates, and she will introduce her panel. Let us give her a hand, please. <laughs> While she's coming up, if you'd like to take a coffee or something, because I figure you don't need another break right now. We want to continue, correct? So if you want to slip out and get something and come back, it's okay. Dr. Sabrina, it's all yours. Good afternoon, everyone. The mic is there, right? It's, this is not working. Oh, you want that the big one? Yeah. She's up the okay. You might have to This is also fine. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I appreciate the introduction. Um, I'm excited to present a distinguished panel for the discussion on ESG risk management, identification, and mitigation. We have a diverse group of experts who bring a wealth of experience in sustainability, climate change, and strategic management. Uh, let me start with the introduction of our first panelist, Ms. Dina Storey. Ms. Dina Storey is an expert in climate change and sustainability, serving as an executive advisor to various global organizations in the government, NGO, and private sectors. With over 18 years of experience, she is currently a senior partner with Marfa Advisors, focusing on sustainable finance, government relations, tech innovations, and police uh, policy strategy. Uh, Ms. Dina has held roles such as Senior Director for the UAE Independent Climate Change Accelerators and ESG and Sustainability Partner, uh, partner with Strategy and PWC MENA. Uh, now let's turn our attention to the second panelist, Ms. Uh, Shamla Yusuf. Ms. Shamla Yusuf is an accomplished female business professional with a distinguished uh, uh, career uh, in market analysis, strategic planning, and transformative consulting. Her journey is a testament to outstanding achievements from steering ethical supply chains for retail brands to shaping growth strategies with the European Union cultural relations platform and participating in a USSAID project that researched the hindrances faced by females, political participation in Sri Lanka, and contribution to the UN Voluntary National Review on SDGs in Sri Lanka. Uh, moving on to our third panelist, Ms. Sadaf Hamid. Ms. Sadaf Hamid is an accomplished professional with over 16 years of uh, project management and construction experience within the oil and gas industry. With growing awareness of the impacts of traditional energy sources, Ms. Sadaf transitioned into her current role a sustainability manager that allows her to contribute to sustainable practices within the industry she knows so well. Uh, now let's introduce our fourth panelist, Ms. Tasneem Bakri. Uh, Ms. Tasneem Bakri is the head of climate change and policy at Elpin and is responsible for managing net zero advisory, decarbonization strategies, ESG consultancy, and guidelines and policy development for private and, uh, and public agencies. Uh, last but certainly not least, our final panelist is Mr. Mohammed Fayumi. Mr. Mohammed Fayumi is the Vice President for Facilities Management at ADNH. Uh, he knows a lot about managing facilities, assets, and technical services. He led some important projects like Project 500, then uh, the Total Sustainability Index, and uh, also the Hotel Carbon Measurement uh, uh, Initiative. So, esteemed panelists, we are truly honored to have your expertise and insights with us today. Without further ado, I kindly invite our esteemed panelists to join us on the stage. Can we clap for them?
So as we kick off our discussion on ESG risk management, I'm eager to hear insights from each of our esteemed panelists. Let's start with an overview of the general ESG landscape. Ms. Dina Storey, could you please share your perspective on how the ESG landscape has evolved in your respective industry over the past few years? And what notable changes have you observed in terms of prioritization and strategic focus? Thank you very much. I think uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I think ESG has come a long way uh, in terms of first the understanding of the meaning of ESG, but also the importance of it. So I think from the perspective, I'll talk about the region in general and about the fact that uh, there's a lot of talk about ESG at COP. Uh, we see that there's a dynamic shift between just understanding and reporting but integrating ESG into the... Um, story for setting the stage. I would like to turn to Ms. Shamla Yusuf. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. So, coming from the metals and industry, which is quite controversial by nature, uh, as a purpose-driven business, we looked at where we can make an impact. As a result, we started looking at the metals value chain and understanding how the supply chain works. And we understood that there is a huge demand for, uh, driven by the renewable energy market, for quite special metals such as zinc and cobalt. But these are traditionally mined, which again makes us question whether renewable energy is going to really contribute to emissions and uh, negative social impact from the mining. So how can we solve this problem? That's where our company and our group of investors thought to redesign the supply chain to make it more sustainable and more circular. And that's how our company Metalac came to being. So we are a purpose-driven company. Uh, we source our uh, raw materials, which is hazardous waste, dust, and hazardous scrap metal um, from the metal, um, metal companies, metal smelters, and furnace companies. We collect these uh, scrap metal and hazardous waste and we repurpose them, that is recycle them, to uh, provide green metal for the renewable energy industry as well as the metal industry in general. So we thought of redesigning the supply chain, the existing supply chain, to introduce more circularity in it. And this is where our governance model lies. We believe in purpose over profit. So planet over profit and people over profit. So that is how our business strategy is contributing towards reducing the carbon footprint and also negative social impact on the uh, human resources from the mining industry, going green and going sustainable. Over to you. Um, thank you, Ms. Shamla Yusuf. Now let's hear from Ms. Sadaf Hamad. Yes. Hamid, sorry. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. So yeah, just about the ESG landscape, like um, Dina said, there is so much the ESG landscape has evolved so rapidly. And with the um, oil and gas industry, we see two clear um, changes. And that is basically there's an increased awareness within the industry of how important ESG risks are to our operations and what their impacts would be to financials, to our financials and then also what climate change might do to our physical and transition risks to our operations. And then the second focus is that there's an increasing demand from the market, our investors, clients, for increased reporting. So no longer, um, ESG reporting is no longer mandatory, there, I mean voluntary. There is more and more interest in um, greater reporting and greater transparency in reporting. So that's the difference. Appreciate your insights, uh, Ms. Sadaf Hamid. Ms. Tasneem Bhatri. 
Yes, yeah. you can go ahead. So in terms of the landscape, I believe uh, we have seen a huge shift from ESG uh, being a global uh, concept that we hear about. <coughs> Yeah, I think this is better. Um, so in terms of the landscape of uh, ESG, I believe we have shifted from ESG being um, a Western topic, let's say, to seeing it more and more in the MENA region. Uh, a huge change is that some of the concepts of ESG are now embedded within the businesses that have emerged from the Middle East uh, region, and I believe this is a huge shift from 10 years ago, uh, let's say. And whether the business owners are attracted to the concept of ESG because they feel that there is a mandate coming, uh, or whether it's a genuine motivation from their end uh, to make their business better, more ethical, uh, I believe it's a, it's a huge shift from the previous years uh, that we see, even in the um, thinking of business owners. They are no longer thinking that sustainability works against their finances. Thank you very much for your valuable insight. Finally, let's hear from Mr. Mohammed Fayoumi. Well, I think it's not only talking about ESG. I think it's talking about the sustainability in general and how it has shifted in the past couple of decades. Maybe I'm one of the lucky people who have seen this evolving pretty much, uh, not only in UAE, but uh, across the MENA region. So it simply has shifted from trying to convince the stakeholders of the importance of sustainability and environmental awareness to now setting realistic goals. And you have the stakeholders themselves. They grasp the... Uh, sustainability in a way that is helping the business, uh, it adds into the saving. And the biggest example or two examples I would say, whether it is from an environmental point of view or from a social point of view, is this panel itself. Uh, two decades ago, it would have been difficult to find only one man among four women in the same panel. But today it is possible and that's a great shift. Uh, the second thing I would use the uh, COVID period itself. The COVID period probably, despite being a pandemic, despite that we have been all stressed all over the world, yet it also opened eyes. It really opened eyes of rather than looking into cost cutting to be cost conscious, to be cost wise. And that also has contributed a lot into shifting the landscape in sustainability and ESG. Uh, thank you all for your valuable insights on the general ESG landscape. It is fascinating to see how the prioritization and strategic focus have evolved in diverse industries. Uh, moving on to the next question, could you share specific methodologies or frameworks your organization employs to comprehensively identify environmental, social, and governance risks? Yeah, anyone can start. We okay. can start from the left or the right this time. No worries. <laughs> So I'll, I'll give an example of uh, the World Expo 2020 because I was the Director of Sustainability for Expo 2020. Um, and looking beyond just the, the targets that were put in place when the UAE bid for the Expo, we had to make sure that we create um, sustainable infrastructure. Uh, we had to talk about uh, operations that, are, that meet certain requirements when it comes to um, water, waste, energy, and sometimes that's not easy when you have a site that uh, is twice the size of the, uh, Monaco as a country. Um, and then the third thing is we had to make sure that there's a legacy with what we're doing, uh, not just from a building perspective, not just from an operations perspective, but from the processes and what we're doing. We started reporting back in 2017 uh, and we issued our first sustainability report. And the whole idea is to be as transparent as possible and to make sure that we um, not only meet certain indicators and, uh, and um, put the data out there, but we also put the good, the bad, and the ugly. It doesn't make a difference. 
Um, and that was, a, that was kind of a, a, a game changer when it came to ESG and sustainability reporting in the region because we're telling the entire story. And then we, cr we had two uh, more reports after that and then a final report that was the impact report from um, social, environmental and economic impact that went to, uh, back to the BIE, which is the organizing committee of, the, uh, of expos. And so what happened was that when the expo started and there was some negative press coming in and all of that other stuff, it, it, it didn't affect us because we had already uh, reported on it years and years ago. So authenticating the, the information, we could say, well, go back to our uh, reports, go back to our website, and you will find the reports that are third party verified with all of the information, the data, the good and the bad. So we have to understand that it may be a risk, but we need to tell the entire story. The other thing that we did is we put all of our strategies, all of our policies and procedures up on the website. So anyone can learn from them, anyone can take them, anyone can utilize them, but also it creates that transparency. And therefore it created a blueprint, not only for Expo City now, but also for other entities to say, okay, we can do this in a better way. We can report from an ESG perspective in a way that de-risks us by providing all of the information. So that's uh, just an example Thank of Thank you very much that. for your valuable uh, inputs on this topic. Now let's hear from our other um, panelist. Anyone can go, it's okay. Okay, I'll go next. Yeah, then. sure. So, uh, in terms of what frameworks we've used, um, we first of all conduct materiality assessments to really understand what the ESG risks that are important to us, what are the new emerging issues, and we do this yearly. Um, we also, just to look at all the three pillars of ESG, environmental, social, and governance, we go into further detail, taking each pillar separately, and then reviewing specific risks related to either social or environment, and we're basically aligned with um, ISO requirements. So social risks are um, in alignment with ISOs, as, as are uh, environment risks. And um, with the climate change risks and risks related to physical or transition risks, we conduct uh, TCFD-aligned workshops to really understand what the impact of that would be on our assets and our operations. So that's essentially what we're using to analyze currently what our ESG risks are. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, I think in the case of uh, Abu Dhabi National Hotels, the uh, picture is a little bit different because we are so lucky being one of the entrepreneurs and the first companies in the UAE that was specialized and founded to manage and own hotels in Abu Dhabi and across UA. And this of course adds to the uh, ESG side by having a different approach because we have hotels which are heritage hotels that require a completely different approach than a brand new hotel that would have been built in the past couple of years. And this is why uh, Abu Dhabi National Hotels is following a very realistic approach by changing the framework of reporting for heritage hotels that require a long, uh, a long plan actually to bring these hotels from an environmental and from an energy point of view, how do we really you bring it to the 21st century, while the new hotels is a little bit easier to report over there. But all in all, what we focus on is the data, collecting the data, analyzing the data and ensure that the data is really accurate. That sometimes is challenging, but this is the way we take it. And this is why our methodology focuses on collecting the data on a on, uh, monthly basis, actually. So we develop monthly reports, and eventually, by the end of the year, we come up with a concentrated report for the whole group. Yeah. Yeah, so in, uh, in terms of the risk, I look at uh, the risk in the ESG sector as a whole. Uh, there's a risk of uh, disconnect between the E and the G, uh, where 
everyone is always concerned about the environmental impact but less people are talking about the governance and the governance of the company and that's impact on the environment so the the overall reporting on how the leadership and the board of directors approach the ESG as a whole should also be incorporated in the report to understand the uh, the value they place on the table for climate change and for impact businesses and in this this plays a pivotal role in capital allocation as well where we understand okay these companies are going beyond uh, simply reporting their impact they are actually trying to make a difference uh, irrespective of whether they are in a carbon intensive business or a normal SME it's about reporting the attitude a management adopts and also in addition I would say lots of uh, companies there are silos where the the reporting is in one silo and the management is on the other so is your company driven towards mm -hmm. making a contribution and is your company uh, doing something to make a difference because these days when it comes to ESG it's about oh I measured my carbon and oh I bought my carbon credits and that's it I can generate as much as carbon as I want and also I can purchase the credits and that's it I've contributed but what are we actually doing as a company to reduce our carbon footprints right are we practicing enough transparency in measurement are we measuring our daily transportation of employees? Are we measuring our sea transportation, for instance? Uh, I'm in the material industry, and so my company has a lot of carbon footprints on uh, sea transportation. So how would the management look for ways to optimize the transportation and reduce this? And ensuring that there are benchmarks in place for the measurement of how we've uh, performed over time and have our visions contributed towards reducing these risks is also important. Thank you very much for your valuable insights. Uh, Ms. Tasneem Bakri, would you like to add something to what they said? Yeah, so for the case of uh, Alpen Limited, because we are sustainability consultants, we look at the international frameworks with a critical eye. So when it came um, the time for us to implement the frameworks or choose a framework for our own operations, uh, we actually conducted um, a huge comparison between all of these uh, standards and frameworks in order to understand which one fits us best. Um, we did arrive at a combination of standards uh, and our uh, annual sustainability report is all also showcasing that but mostly we focused on the GRI um, framework because we felt that it's comprehensive enough uh, for the operations of our company. Um, now, when it comes to our, our role in helping clients figure out their framework, um, it's obviously a journey that depends on where the client is at right now. Um, sometimes we, we see companies that have absolutely no clue about sustainability, they've never had any effort that remotely relates to sustainability in their past. And so reporting on a GRI uh, framework might demotivate that company from the beginning because it will show them a lot of gaps. Um, and this is just one of our strategies as sustainability consultants is that you need that motivation from the company. Uh, so when you report on a standard that is entirely unachievable for your organization at the moment, uh, it will lead to you feeling like the whole sustainability topic is unachievable. Uh, so I believe it's really important to ch choose the correct framework and in the end, the end goal is for you to be able to report on all of them. Uh, thank you all for your valuable insights on this topic. Uh, now let's delve into our third topic, panelists. I'm eager to learn about the strategies and innovative approaches that have proven effective in your organizations for mitigating ESG risks. Anyone may go first with their thoughts on this question. Okay, so um, I'll start. Uh, 
what has really proved uh, instrumental in um, helping us mitigate ESG risk is first aligning or understanding what our ESG risk is and then incorporating it into all our operations. So, like you said, you know, procedures and everything, we've taken a hard look at everything and embedded ESG considerations within our entire operation. It's essentially become DNA within the company and no one department or no one function is responsible for sustainability, but the entire company is responsible to help uh, understand what the risks are and then help mitigate them. So that has been key to identify new emerging issues and um, ESG risk, and that's essentially what I have to say. <laughs> if I may add a note uh, to the concept that the whole company is part of it, this is a concept that we really like to push as sustainability consultants, is that you have to have champions on the inside uh, from the company, but still there's another angle to that is that um, there are sustainability experts, so most of the time that in-house effort is emerging from um, the management not being convinced of putting a budget out for the concept of sustainability and them wanting to basically do the whole thing in-house and um, you will basically end up having people who have never worked with these frameworks or the sustainability concept trying to maneuver their way around these frameworks. And I'm not only saying that to market our services as sustainability consultants, maybe a little bit, but um, it's actually important that you leverage the expertise of people who are already in the field. I don't want to make this look really easy, but probably in Abu Dhabi National Hotels, we are one of the very lucky companies that we have a leadership that is totally into sustainability. So we have the top management driving this rather than all the different layers. And this is why I have, for example, uh, three of my colleagues right here today, Reem, Ziad, and Mark, we are all coming over here to share our experience, which we believe that can benefit the uh, whole community in UAE. One of the things that we do is we work very closely with the local authorities because, yeah, probably we have the specialists within the company, but this is a continuously evolving uh, field and new methodologies come, new technologies come, and new experiences come to the market. And the best people to do this is probably the local authorities. So we are very closely coordinating with the Department of Tourism and Culture. We set our goals on a yearly basis, but we don't carve them in stone if we feel during the year that something really came in that helped us to improve our targets. And at the same time, we have a yearly investment plan to enhance our approach to the environment. So. For this year, for example, we have an investment of 23 million dirhams. This is just for the energy side of sustainability. Uh, not every company is lucky as we are, but I think this is a very good approach to have the budgets prepared for every single year, have the targets prepared for every single year, and welcome any new idea that comes, whether from the local authorities or from other consultants or from anybody who can contribute into the company's goals. Excellent insights. Uh, anyone else from the panelists would like to add a few lines, words? To add to that, um, Understanding the value chain by looking at what are your core business uh, processes, what are your core products and services, and how your, uh, uh, how your output is derived, and sort of creating an impact chain through that. And on the way, having a lookout on where which SDGs that we can contribute to. Uh, is a small step for beginners to sort of understand the chain of your production or your service process and then to map down your impact and then sort of understand, okay, where are we right now on the baseline level? And then 
Next year, if we contribute a little bit, less than 10% of your revenue or our profit, towards making a small change on one part of this value chain, how much of a profit and how much of an impact that we can make is probably one of the easiest ways for SMEs as well as large organizations who are starting their journey uh, to sort of embark on this uh, ESG process is what I would like to add. I hope others would also agree to this. Yeah, I totally agree. Absolutely. I think one of the the, the, the most important first step to de-risking your ESG reporting is to make sure that you have a good materiality uh, exercise and to make sure that your internal and external stakeholders are aligned with what you're doing because <coughs> that misalignment will create a, a much higher risk uh, when you start collecting your data and reporting. So materiality exercise, making sure your internal and external stakeholders are aligned with your targets and aligned with what you're reporting on for that specific year. Um, excellent uh, insights. Now let's move on to the next topic. We'll continue with our one-by-one -one approach. Uh, could you share your perspective on the role your organization plays in addressing climate change and achieving decarbonization goals? What challenges have you encountered in your journey, in this journey? Great question. So f first of all, I just want to say something. I don't believe in sustainability. I think that we should forget sustainability because we are beyond that sustainable ESG. We love ESG, we love the terminologies, but we have to think a little bit further than that. And, and I say that wholeheartedly because sustainability as a word, be besides being overused, means sustaining the status quo. We cannot sustain the status quo. We have to go beyond that. And in order for us to go beyond that, we have to figure out as organizations, as companies, as people, how we can regenerate and how we can, let's say, dig ourselves out of a hole, so to speak. So in order for us to do that, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's challenging. Um, the first thing we have to do is understand that we need to regenerate. How do we do that? By creating new processes, by creating new capabilities um, for our organizations to regenerate what, what, what we've already contributed to. So from an emissions perspective and, and other things. If we think about regeneration, we will surpass the sustainability criteria that we have. And if we look at ESG as a benchmark for the following year and the following year and the following year, that's the only way for us to move forward. The challenges that we face when we are reporting on ESG or even when we're trying to explain the concepts of regener regeneration, which you will hear a lot at COP right now about regeneration, regenerative finance, regenerative agriculture, regenerative industries, we need to understand that it didn't come from a vacuum. It came from the basis that we went from an extractive economy where we were extracting, extracting, extracting extracting to a green economy where we realized we have to do things differently to sustainability and the sustainable development goals sustaining the status quo which means we are not doing any harm to regeneration so for us to be able to move to that next level we have to have a baseline and our baseline is ESG and also to be uh, more confidently vocal about our carbon footprint because lots of companies on ESG reporting like to say that um, they've uh, bought the carbon credits and they are contributing to decarbonization. But seldom do we see that, uh, oh, we are generating so much of carbon and we have a target to cut down this carbon by this percent next year. It can be less than 10%, it's okay, but at least you're taking a step. So that practicing that transparency and being able to confidently report on your uh, emissions is one thing. Uh, this inspires other companies as well to come forward and going to scope three reporting. And additionally, looking at your current supply chains, 
to see how we can redesign them and sort of reorganize them to achieve uh, efficiency on impact as well as on your profits. Uh, this, I think, would contribute towards a paradigm shift when it comes to, you know, um, the ESG landscape as a whole, like she said, regeneration and not about sustaining the status quo. Um, completely agree with uh, being able to report on our carbon emissions uh, transparently and accurately. And uh, I come from an oil and gas construction background and the first step we did to sort of uh, starting our decarbonization journey was to set absolute emission reduction targets. So they were not uh, you know, intensity based, they were absolute emission targets. We've set a net zero by 2050 and a 50% reduction in our scope one and scope two emissions by 2030. And I'm proud to report that, you know, we have been able to achieve an year on year reduction on um, our uh, carbon emissions and we've achieved almost 22% of our 22, 2030 goal. Um, and how we've managed to achieve that is um, essentially with the use of renewable power. And at the moment, both on-site renewable generation, electricity generation, but also off-site. And so renewable energy certificates, simply because of the, um, the market and the non-availability of on-site um, renewable energy sources. But the challenges that we have faced is that um, we have a hard to abate sector. We have a lot of marine vessels. And uh, this sector is really hard to abate. And at the moment, we do see a technology gap where as we are building our roadmap to the net zero targets, we just don't have the technology available to help us achieve significant emission reductions. We do, we have done whatever we can, so elimination of single-use plastic, reuse of uh, water, so all of that, but it is a high emitting sector and it needs radical technology change. So that's the biggest challenge right now. and We're really looking and evaluating what comes into the market and how soon we can look at these uh, groundbreaking technologies. There are two challenges that I want to highlight um, throughout all our work with our clients. We've seen two repeatedly experienced challenges, which the first one is the resistance. Um, and that's just because of human nature. Actually, both challenges are because of human nature. We are creatures of habit. If we have a certain routine and you put this ESG or sustainability onto my table and it wasn't there yesterday, uh, there has to be some type of resistance unless you um, attack it with, a, with awareness. So that's where our work as sustainability consultants uh, becomes important because we build capacities before we expect people to be convinced with the concept of ESG. And the second challenge, which is also because of human nature, is the risk of greenwashing. And the reason I say that's because of human nature is because as humans, we tend to want to polish ourselves or show the best image. And in businesses as well, you see higher management every now and then trying to make the numbers look better. They think it's not uh, really an issue. And not only is that unethical, it, it could actually end the livelihood of a business. When we talk about greenwashing, the only companies that can get over a scandal or a reputation issue with greenwashing are the huge global companies that can, um, that their scale is much bigger than a small issue. But for mid-sized businesses, a reputation issue with the ethical performance, with their uh, transparency, could actually end their business if the 10 to 15 suppliers or clients you have uh, start to tell you they don't want to work with you because you are not reporting or you're reporting unethically, uh, that's a huge risk that higher management should uh, start taking into consideration. Mr. Mahmoud, would you like to say something? 
Well, from my side, I would just like to add that uh, following on the same realistic approach that uh, we do for every activity that we plan in ADNH, looking to the sustainability, which, Professor, I agree with you, we should go beyond the sustainability. However, I wouldn't just stick to the terminology. I would stick to the goals that are being set, like a speedy car 20 years ago, that how the world was, just transmitting carbon footprint everywhere. So probably the first thing is just to hit the brakes, then we go reverse. So probably this is uh, one of the things that every organization should be looking at. Uh, from our side, we are uh, following on every technology that comes in, and we set our goals based on our business model. Yes, of course, we are part of UAE, we are part of the Sustainability Year, we are part of the nation's vision, and we fully are uh, engaged in these activities. But at the same time, not everything, every goal applies to every business unit. And this is where analyzing the data, analyzing the impact that every business unit is uh, contributing to the CO2 footprint should be the very first step that every company <coughs> does. Uh, a simple example for everybody just to be uh, in line with what I'm saying. If you look to any hotel and you analyze its energy here in UAE, you will realize that anywhere between 50 to 55 percent of that energy cost goes to electricity. So it doesn't make sense to make your main focus in the beginning on natural gas when you can make a big impact by reducing the electricity consumption. And this is exactly what we do. We keep on analyzing, we keep on collecting data, we keep on generating graphs according to which we set the yearly goals of the company. And to add to that, harnessing the power of AI in uh, big data processing uh, to find optimal ways in energy consumption, in carbon emissions, would be a big game changer uh, when it comes to adopting ESG best practices. Uh, so uh, looking out for solution providers uh, through AI channels, uh, because uh, we are, AI is developing so fast and we sometimes get a bit backtracked. So, um, having an open eye to solution providers who can track and help us understand how we can use AI to optimize uh, our operations to reduce emissions and the climate risk as well would be a good enabler. Just um, yeah. All right, please go ahead. Ms. Hello, Dina, you want to say something? Yeah, all right. Thank you all for your insights on this topic. I think we are running out of time.